All right. Uh, take your Bible. Let's see here. Turn to Isaiah 26. I want to start out there. Um, somebody sent this verse to me last night in a message, and um, it was a real blessing. I want you to think about the possibility. Well, we know that God, everything that God does, He does on purpose. And He has a purpose to it. And as I said earlier, now I've got it tangled up here. And I don't know how I did it. There we go. Um, we know that everything that God does, He does on purpose. And I have uh, prayed multiple times. I want my country back. I want the land that my grandfather grew up in. My grandmother's grandfather's. The, my, my mom's father although she didn't know him very well, was a Southern Baptist preacher. And I want the land and the country that he preached in years ago. Um, what I have known all my life, being a child of the 60s and the 70s, um, all I've seen is the wickedness abound in America. And uh, Isaiah 26, verse 20, says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. I want you to think about the great wisdom that is in that verse. And uh, we're facing an enemy. It's been called, believe it or not, um, I've heard Governor Cuomo of of uh, New York refer to this several times as a beast. I've heard him say it. And um, that, that's interesting to me. And it literally is. I mean, this is a wild, creeping thing that has the potential to do great harm around the world. And... Um, my prayer is that God's people, as in the days of Moses, when they were about ready to leave Egypt, that God would shelter and hide his people, which is what he's good at. And uh, so I want you to think about that. Verse 21 says, For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood. And shall no more cover her slain. And again, I appreciate that verse being sent to me uh, last night. I thought it useful enough to be able to include it in what I'm going to say this morning. So I want you to now turn to the book of John chapter 4, uh, if you would. And I want you to consider the blessing as we turn to John. Um, the blessing that we're not Roman Catholic. And let me explain what I mean by that. Roman Catholic doctrine is such that they cannot, it's sort of like Islam. If you want to destroy Islam, it's easy to do. You drop about a thousand pig bombs on Mecca and you destroy Mecca and you drop pig bombs all over it so that it can never be restored because the religion of Islam requires that Mecca be there in its place because five times a day every Muslim has to roll out a carpet drop on the ground face Mecca and pray to Allah or pray to this idol the Kaaba in Mecca five times a day. You want to destroy the religion, it's real simple to do. And as far as Roman Catholicism is concerned, Roman Catholicism requires that the people who are Roman Catholics must be inside the Catholic Church building itself 
they must physically be actually at a, at a spot on the floor. It's where if a, a Catholic church is, is designed in the shape of a cross, they have what's called a nave and a transept, and there's a spot on the floor. It's where in a Catholic funeral, all the caskets have to be, casket has to be in that spot. In the Catholic Mass, those who receive the wafer, the Eucharist, they must receive it standing in that spot, must be given to them by a priest, must be blessed by a priest. They can't, they can't do that outside of the building of the church. To do so would be to violate, what, a thousand years or better of Roman Catholic dogma. So their religion for their version of salvation requires that they must be in a Catholic church building standing in a certain spot with the priest handing them the Eucharist or they can't receive their version of salvation. We hold no such super superstitions. We can still be God's people any place anywhere, anytime. John 4, this is what Jesus was explaining to the woman at the well. And I have a lot of scripture to go through, so I'm going to try to hurry through this. But John 4, verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. See, she was a Samaritan. She was of the ten northern tribes of Samaria and Samaria was the capital of that and since the days of Jeroboam and Rehoboam when the kingdom was divided uh, I think it was Jeroboam that built a temple or some sort of house of worship an altar up in Samaria and that's what she was referring to our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. And that's exactly what I was talking about. Verse 22, You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Tell me where is the place that you can't do that. You can do that just about any place in this world. And so, uh, verse uh, 24, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. And when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You help me, uh, help me pray and pray. That God will give me grace to preach. Heavenly Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd bless uh, your word this morning. I thank you, dear God, for the ability to preach the gospel and to be taken from this place and going all over the world. Father, we pray, dear God, that you'd bless those who hear, no matter where they are, no matter what place they are. Father, we're thankful, God, that we can be your people any place at any time we thank you dear God for not turning us over to vain superstitions that we have to be in this building or that we have to be uh, on a certain day or whatever father you've given us liberty in Christ to worship you each and every day and father we believe that this is the first day of the week and so this is the Lord's day but father any day can be the Lord's day where you are Lord and where you are King and where you are the ruler of men's hearts, Father, that day is yours. And so, Father, we thank you, dear God, that you have given us liberty so that we can be your peculiar people in our homes, at our place of work. Father, we can worship you, we can pray to you, we can read your word, we can hear the preaching of your word just about any place, Father, that we go, and we thank you for that. So, Father, while we are separated one from another during this time of crisis, help us, to, Father, to realize, God, 
that it's not the building that makes the church. It is the hearts and the lives of the people, Father. That's your temple. That's your dwelling place. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that while we are separated from one another, that we not lose sight of that. But, Father, we also then pray for the day where we can all come together again in liberty, in freedom, in, in thanksgiving, coming back into this place once again to worship you together. Father, I thank you for my church family. And I long to be with them again. And I pray, dear God, that you would hasten the day, Lord, that you would gather us together again in one place. But, Father, while you have us separated, help us, dear God, also to be separated from this world as well. And I pray, dear God, that, again, that during this time we would draw closer to you. And that, Father, wherever we are and wherever we worship, Father, we would worship you in spirit, we would worship you in truth. And, Father, help us to realize, God, that the church is wherever we are. Father, open our eyes to your word. Help us, give us understanding. Help us to see it the way they saw it back in the days of Paul and Peter when they went from house to house preaching the word. And I pray, dear God, that you would do likewise during this time. Bless the words of the preacher and bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, several years ago, again, I, I did this study. I'm having a bad hair day and a bad tie day. My tie won't stay together. But when I became mindful of the fact that people were worshiping with us at home, uh, we were encouraged to do online streaming. And before that, we were just posting our sermons on the Internet on Sermon Audio. And somebody said Sermon Audio runs a great deal that just it doesn't take very much at all to stream through them and you could stream your service live and we talked about it as a church and we decided that we would go ahead and do that and we also decided that we wouldn't try to change who we are and what we are we would just continue to be who we are and uh, since then the Lord has blessed that and then people began to tell us that they were watching at home not just on their computers but on their big screen TVs in their living room so that caused us to want to invest a little bit and have a little bit better signal that goes out, a little bit better cameras and so on. But then I did a study years ago and I was surprised. Because again, people were being accused by their family members of not, of violating scriptures in Hebrews where it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We'll get there in a little bit. But people, they were being accused by family members of not coming to church or not gathering with a church body. And they had decided that because this church was going to preach out of the NIV and this church was going to preach out of the Message Bible and this church wasn't going to preach out of any Bible, that they were not going to be a part of that. They were going to be separate from that. They didn't feel like they just, just to go to a church that they had to compromise what they believed and what they stood for. And so I did a study on this and I was amazed at what I found out. Acts chapter 7, verse 48, the Bible says, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. As saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? I've been in this church building for most of my life. I know all the knot holes in the ceiling. I know where all the little kids, I remember when as a little kid I used to get up under this stage. I don't want to crawl under there now. I'm too old. But I've been part of this building for most of my life. This building is part of me. I don't want to be anywhere else. I don't want to go to church anywhere else. But I've said it before. If we lose this building, we are still Bethel Church. And nobody can take that away from us. God does not truly dwell in temples made with hands. 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved... We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And one of the things I want to say to all of God's people who cannot be here this morning is that where you are right now is where the church of God is. It's where the Holy Ghost is. And one of these days when God dissolves all of these houses and this house, we have a far better one to go to when we get to heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. 
Hebrews 9, 11, but Christ being come and high priest of, of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Now, don't get me wrong. My ancestors in this church did not want me chewing gum in this church, did not want me eating candy in this church, did not want me drinking soda pop in, the, in this, I'm talking about this room right here. And I think they would come up out of the grave and get me if I did something like that. I have this building, the first time I came here was they did a building dedication service and this building was set aside for the use of God's kingdom and the church of Jesus Christ and for his service. And I think that's what we ought to use it for. We ought to reverence God's house. Amen? But technically, this is not God's house. God's house is us and we are the temple of God. Consider John. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. What church did John go to? The Bible tells us that John was in exile. Where did I tell you to go? Revelation. I was going to John. I might have said John. But anyway, John says uh, in Revelation 1 verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, I want you to think about that word. Tribulation. Think about what it means. It means trouble. Have we not been troubled by these things that are going on? I'm troubled when I'm hearing about people that are losing their jobs. When my son, when I found out my son lost his job, he was laid off. That troubles me. That's technically what the word tribulation means. It means trouble, troubled times. And um, actually, it's a Latin word. There's a, there's a tool that they used called a tribulum. And it had like three prongs on it. And it's what they used back in, back in the old days to thresh wheat. You know what that's for? It's to get the chaff off of the wheat germ. The chaff is our flesh. And sometimes it takes a little tribulation to get this flesh off of us and out of our way so we can serve God. Amen? So don't tell me that we're not appointed to tribulation. I know what the Bible says about that, and I may preach that some Sunday. I don't want to scare anybody. And I don't think that we are in the tribulation. But truly, because people have contacted me, I know how they're feeling they're hearing the news, they're, they're reading things on the internet, and it is troubling to them. And they are in fear, and I understand that fear. So we have a companion, the Apostle John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Why was he there? He was there according to history, we don't necessarily see this in the Bible, but according to history, the Roman government tried to kill John. And the story is they tried to boil him in oil and kill him. And he lived through it. I would not want to be boiled in oil, but I certainly wouldn't want to live through it. But God allowed him to live through it. John was then the only apostle that we know of that died of old age. The rest of them were killed for preaching the gospel. People, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. We may enter, if we think this time is tough, we may enter into harder times. I hate to say that. But I'm telling you, wherever you are, God is going to be there with you. So that's why John, when they decided they couldn't kill him, they exiled him, they put him on a boat and put him on the Isle of Patmos to keep him away from everybody. And John was there by himself. And what was he doing on the Lord's Day? He was in the Spirit. He was praying. 
he was having church. Where he was, wherever, whatever home he was living in, he was there by himself, but he wasn't by himself. God was with him. Jesus was with him. Jesus showed up to be there with him on the Lord's day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So can, think about John. Do we, is it some rule or some law that on the Lord's day we have to be in a church building with everybody else? The answer is no. Now, don't use, if you use what I just said as a license to drop out of church completely and do what I know some people do. Well, there ain't no church that's right anymore, which is a lie. That is not what the scriptures said. There are still churches that are preaching the truth. It's just that you got such a rebellious nature, you can't be in one. Amen to that. But if you use that as a license to just drop out of church, that's on you. That's not on me. Because he did tell us to gather ourselves together. But here's John who doesn't have an alternative. But he's doing right. Why? Because it's in his heart. It's not a commandment. He's doing it because he wants to do it. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So now turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Here's our commandment. What we're told to do and the reason why we're told to do it. Now, here I am preaching about how you can be the church at home. But I'm telling you, the very second that they lift that order, we're going to come back in this place and we're going to have church. I guarantee you that. And here's the reason why. Hebrews 10 verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith of faith and faith only comes by hearing the word of God so I have a recommendation everybody if you find yourself lacking faith get your Bible out and read it some more keep reading it until you start believing it let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The pure water is the word of God, not water baptism. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. The word wavering has the word wave in it. And yes, sometimes our faith is like this. We have ups and downs in it, but God is like this. He never wavers. He's always steady. His hand, God, listen, God doesn't catch viruses. He's not afraid to be near people, amen? So he said, let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And here it is right here. This is the reason why we do what we do. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So why should we come and be part of a church? To, to consider one another. Maybe you're having a terrible week. And you need to be in with some people that can give you confidence, that can give you encouragement, that can give you faith and restore that back in you. Or maybe you've had a great week. Come and share that with the people that haven't had a great week. Amen? Share that. Spread that around. Your cup, run, your cup runneth over for a reason. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not, and that's part of the sentence. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some people forsake the assembling of themselves together. Some people think, oh, I can be just good a Christian without going to any church. That's what they think, but they're wrong. But we are to exhort one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Now, here's, the, here's what I want you to ask yourself. When has the day not been approaching? <laughs> From the moment Christ ascended to heaven, the clock started, and the day was approaching. Are we not now closer to it than they were back when Jesus ascended to heaven? Yes. So we have a reason to come into God's house. And again, I'm going to say it. 
as soon as they say, y'all can get back together again. We're going to get back together again. We're not going to forsake that. And, and I want to, I, listen, I want to encourage you because I've, I've been through this several years ago and then there's no way, I already know I'm not going to get through all my scripture notes. There was a, a winter several years ago when I was pastoring out in Richwoods that we had, an, had ice storms over the weekend and we had to cancel church. And I remember sitting home with wife and the girls were all little then and, and um, you know, I read the Bible and prayed that day and, you know, tried to have a semblance of doing something on the Lord's Day. The next Sunday that rolled around, another ice storm came in, we had to cancel church again. Two Sundays in a row we had to cancel church. And that second Sunday, the first Sunday I was going, man, I, I hate not being in church. I hate not being in church. The second Sunday was going, hey, let's go rent some movies. Let's, it was like, it was just any other day that we had a day off. And that scared me. Because I thought, if after two Sundays, I'm already getting used to not going to God's house on Sunday. So the next Sunday, they were calling for more storms. And I said, we're having church. And the church had a house that nobody lived in. And I spent the night in that house. The furnace shut off in the middle of the night. So I woke up, it was 35 degrees in that house. I took a cold shower. And there was about 10 people that showed up. But we had church. And I'm telling you, you can get used to not having it. Which is why I always try to commend all of you people who are with us online, every service, you're there, even though you can't be here. My commendation goes to those people who are faithful. If you think it's hard to get up and come here, try being without a church and making yourself do it by turning in online. That's got to be more difficult than getting up and driving over here and coming to church. And so my heart goes out to you, but we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, we find out that the home can be used as a gathering place. In Matthew 7, verse 24, Therefore, therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him uh, unto a wise man which built his what? His house upon a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. The man built his house, his dwelling place, where he and his family were going to be together. That house was founded upon the rock of Jesus Christ. The home is the first gathering place of God's people. Let me hear you say amen. Luke chapter 8, verse 38. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Now he went broadcast it through the whole city. He's walking through the city to go to his house. But he was, he was told by Jesus to go to his house and tell what great things God had done for him. It was at his house that it was the most important place to be. The house is the first church. Before God ever built or instituted the church, he instituted the home. By joining Adam and Eve together and then giving them children. Luke 8, 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, who fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. I want you to think about that phrase. Ask Jesus to come into your house. What is the illustration that Jesus gives us? He says, behold, I stand where? At the door of the what? Of your house. I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open to me, I will come into him and sup with him. And he with me. The fellowship that Christ can have with you by yourself is great and not to be denied. Amen. But then... The fellowship that can be had between a, 
a husband, a wife, and children, and their family in their home on the Lord's day. And then we also know he can come here. The church started in a house. Turn to Acts chapter 2. And suddenly, verse 2, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Let me tell you this. They had not built a church building. They had not built a church building in hopes that the Holy Ghost would come and bless that building they were in. They were in somebody's house. We don't know whose, but they were in somebody's house, and they were meeting there. And in verse 46, the Bible says that after the Holy Ghost was poured out unto them and they preached and all those people got saved, in verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Where did they go? From house to house. And they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. At some point, and I don't know if they've done this already, they're restricting how many goes into a store. I went to Home Depot the other day, and they, they held me up at the door, and they had a counter. And they were counting people going in, they were counting people going out, and they said, we well, could only have so many people in the store at one time. Now, at some point, Walmart's going to have to do that, and all the other grocery stores are going to have to do that. They are doing it. Now, I don't want to scare anybody, but at what point would they restrict people from even going to the store to get bread? That may happen. Let me remind you, who is it that has always fed you? Who fed the Israelites for 40 years? God did. God will either feed you every day, or he'll do what he did with Elijah. Fed him one time, and he went on that for 40 days. Now, I wouldn't mind that. Because I eat too much anyway. Still do. Even I got a little stomach, I still eat too much. But they broke bread from house to house. And they did it with gladness. If you have food in your house right now, be glad that you have food in your house right now. And don't let anything go to waste. Amen? Acts 5.42, daily in the temple. and in every, I want to run through some of these fast. And in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 12, verse 12, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. When they were gathered, many get, were gathered together praying. They were in the house. Acts chapter 16, a certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple in the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. They went and they had church in this lady's house. In verse 30 of Acts chapter 16, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord to all that were in his house. And they took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his, he and all his straightway, when they had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, rejoiced, believing God with all his house. And what I did was I just went through the book of Acts and I found out that there weren't no church building. They didn't have big auditoriums where mega churches are. Maybe this is one thing God's doing. Maybe God's knocking down the pride of some of these mega churches. Amen to that. Acts chapter 20, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in the way of the Jews and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. 
testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Where did Paul do it? He went from house to house. Romans chapter 16, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church, notice this, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 15, I beseech you, brethren, you know that the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Again, they were meeting and having church in their house. And there's no reason why we can't do the same. Colossians 4.15, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. Philemon, I mean, look at it. The church was in this man's house. Philemon, which has one chapter. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer unto our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. You're meeting in your house. Now, while we can have church, while we can stream, and even, God forbid, something worse happen, and the internet gets knocked out. Let me just say this. We have enemies that hate our country. And they know better than to attack a nation while it's strong. So they think to attack while they think we are weak. Now, I don't believe that we have a weak president. And I don't believe that we have weak soldiers. Not anymore. But what if they knock the internet out? God forbid. Can you, or let me ask you this, would you still worship God in your house? Would you still do it? You would either have to or you would just probably just be on your way of walking away from the faith that God has spent years to try to instill in you. You see, there's a reason why we get a little fat on us. It's God's way of providing, and I've been teaching on this on Sunday night, it's God's way of providing for the body that there may come time when there is no food to eat, my body can still survive on what it's stored up. And you can't live on what you haven't stored up. If your cup hasn't been running over, then you can't live off the overflow once the cup is empty. And then my question would be, do you think there's people out there right now who need to know about Jesus and probably would be more apt to listen to the gospel than they were, let's say, five months ago? Let me say this, not necessarily as a chastisement, but as an encouragement. Most of social media right now is full of theories about what's going on and very, very little truth of God's Word. Very little. I've, I've looked and checked. Now to those of you who share Scripture daily, God bless you for it. 
But for those who just do nothing but are stirring up strife, those who are just spreading whatever comes along out there instead of the word of God, the word of truth, consider that while some of these theories may or may not be true, that's not what's going to last forever in somebody's mind and heart. It's the gospel. So when these people had church in their home, it wasn't just, just for them. They evangelized. Look at Matthew chapter 9. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the household, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Where was he? He was in a house. So here's the question. Is Jesus in your house? If he is, invite somebody over so they can meet Jesus. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Who's he going to eat with? There ain't nobody left after publicans and sinners. There is nobody else. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. See, they're making exceptions on who can be out and about. And if you're a minister, like John is a deacon, John has the right to go out and minister to the needs of people who need it. And that nobody reasonable is going to stop him from doing that. And they that don't need it, obviously, he's not going to come by. But those that do need it, that's what he's there for. Those who don't need salvation or don't think they need salvation, they don't need the doctor. But those who do need it and they know they need it, they need to meet the physician and his name is Jesus. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice for I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And I just, again, I want to encourage you. Right now, with everybody sitting at home, what are they doing? They're watching the news and they're reading social media. And in some cases, what they're reading them has them scared literally out of their mind. And again, I don't know if any of this stuff is even true or not. But while we've got everybody sitting at home doing nothing but reading what people are posting online, why don't we take advantage of that by posting massive doses of gospel penicillin all over Facebook? You see, I've noticed that on some people's posts, Facebook will inject a little thing in there that says, this is probably fake news. They started doing that. I don't think they'll ever do that with Scripture. I don't think they'll do it. I don't think they have. They may at some point in the future. But right now, I don't think they will. So why don't God's people, who have nothing better to do, why don't we go with the gospel and push that out on social media and see if maybe we can bring some others in to the house of God like they did back in the days of Paul, Peter, and John. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'm going to close with this. Turn there. If there is anything that we should be doing, 
It is this right here. Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel. In fact, the Jews, every Sabbath service that Jews have, they recite this. They do it in Hebrew, but they recite it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. What words? These words. The Bible shall be in thine heart all day long. They shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest where? In thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down. And when thou risest up. Isn't that amazing? That's four places. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house. And on thy gates. If we were to do anything. That is publish the gospel. Somebody say amen. amen. Publish the gospel. Promote the Bible. Promote the word of God. That's the only truth that we know is 100% Facebook cannot say that's fake news. They can't say it. I don't think they will. Not, not, at least not now. I don't think they will. So I'm encouraging everybody. Share messages that good preachers are preaching. Make up memes with scripture verses in them. Things that will comfort people instead of freaking them out of their mind. Which they already get from everybody else. Give somebody what we're, I mean, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to comfort one another. As we gather together, we're supposed to admonish one another. We're supposed to be there for one another. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to encourage one another. We're supposed to tell people, hey... It ain't the end of the world. But even if it is, praise God, hallelujah, God's still on the throne. He's still going to take us home one of these days. I want us to pray. Pray that the message gets received. Pray that somebody that you know right now that's lost, that at some point something will hit them like a load of bricks and they'll start inquiring about the gospel you know God will have a way of sending people to you that they'll ask you questions have you ever had that happen I've had it happen God will tell me now witness that person God don't know how I'll figure it out and all of a sudden they ask me questions and I'm going oh that's how it's going to happen You can church in home. You can still worship God at home, and I'm encouraging you to do that. But while you're doing that, you also evangelize. Take the opportunity. Father in heaven, I ask your blessings on your word. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless the message that's gone out. And Father, to all those who are in fear, those who are afraid, those who have heard evil reports and rumors and things, whether they be true or not, that, Lord, if they are afraid, if they are in fear, if they're worried about what's going to happen, I pray, dear God, that your Holy Spirit and your word would give them great comfort. I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would open up our eyes to what is going on in this world. Father, I want to know. And Father, I've been seeking you out. I've been asking you. I've been praying. I've been reading the scriptures. I've been seeking you, God, for answers. Because people are asking me, and I don't know what to tell them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would open up your people's eyes in the times that we live. Father, that we could be 
like Noah, who knew the time was approaching. He knew the time that he was in. That we could be like Elijah, who knew the time that he was living in. He knew what to do and he knew where to go. Father, that we could be like Philip, that you called him one day and sent him out to meet a man, a eunuch, on the road to Jerusalem. And God, he may not have understood when you told him to rise up and leave his house and start walking. He may not have understood then where he was going, but when he saw the chariot and the man reading the scriptures, he knew what he had to do. And you saved a man because of that. Father, what great joy we all could have in knowing that something we did, something that you led us to do, something that you used us in, was used to save a poor, lost sinner from the pits of hell. Father, there is no greater joy than that. I've experienced it. It's the greatest feeling I've ever had. And I pray, dear God, that while you've got people home, God, that every day, Lord, could be Sunday for them. Every day they could worship you. Every day, Father, spend time in your word. Every day, spend time in prayer. Every day, trying to reach out to those who don't know what's going on. To reach out to them with what we know is the truth which is your word. Father, put it in our hearts to take what you have spoken to us and proclaim it from every house. That's what you told your disciples, what you speak in the ear there to proclaim from the rooftops. And Father, I pray, Lord, that your people would do just that at a time when our country needs it the most. Father, we pray, dear God, for our church and each and every member. I pray, God, that you'd keep them safe. Father, we pray, Lord, for the good people of Samburu and Turkana. We thank you, dear God, that the Catholic Church has not prevailed against us and we're still on the air and going to be on the air and we're going to feed some people. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless that and put those evil people to shame for wanting to destroy the work that you're doing over there through this church. Father, help us to reach people. Show them that we love them, that we care about them. And we want them to know Jesus, the one who loves them more than we do. Help us, dear God, to share the truth this week, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Come back, be with us 2 o'clock this afternoon. That'll be an hour and a half. I'm going to go take a little doze. And we'll see you at 2. God bless you. Bye-bye.